and to... Oh, what was the name of it? Hi everyone, and welcome to the first discussion episode in this series, The History of Rock with Amy and Carl. We are going to entitle this first episode as Pre-Rock, and you'll find out why in a few moments. I have listened to Cold Shot and to Sing 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 in preparation for this discussion, and you can find the link here, and we will dive in and see what I have to learn and discover next. Yeah, so Amy, when it comes to early uh, forms of music in the 20th century, blues, and I have to say this straight up front, without the American Southlands, I'm talking Louisiana, places like that, we wouldn't have rock and roll music. We just wouldn't. The impact of this music was so significant on where rock would eventually go. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if we take a look from a historical perspective, what was going on, the African-American community had been segregated from the rest of the, rest of the white communities in uh, North America at the time due to slavery and the history of what took place prior to that. In the uh, early parts of the 20th century, the 1900s, um, what you had was you had a lot of influence from previous times, and that includes right. the slavery period. And then what took place was a lot of the music that was sung by the people when they were in the fields picking cotton or whatever their job yep. was, that then transpired into, as technology increased, into this new form of music. This new form of music was the blues. And I, um, I know that you're aware of this, but when it comes to blues music, there's a reason it's called blues. Yes, because blues we t tend to think of as being down and low. And yeah, I got the blues. That's where this all comes That's from. That's where it comes from. So right. the music naturally talks about real life situations, mm -hmm. uh, but it also can be quite depressing. Yes. And that's because people and are... very, very deeply emotionally kind of the singers that sang the blues style and all they would you hear it in their voices yeah, totally it was charged with this energy of yeah. depressiveness and that yes the future wasn't very positive which will come up later on in music as we carry on through the rock uh, side of the house but blues is a, an amazing form of music in that um, it's played generally on a guitar, mm -hmm. sometimes, well, in the early blues, which was broken down into country blues and delta blues, which is based on the geographical region where it came from out of Louisiana. And you had the early guys, the biggest name for most people is Robert Johnson. He was a very well-known blues man. And in fact, the fact that we use Stevie Ray Vaughan, there was a reason I chose Stevie Ray Vaughan. It's nothing against Robert Johnson, who is amazing, but I personally think that Stevie Ray Vaughan was the best bluesman ever. But that's just me. Um, I just love his style, and he plays very much in that blues style. So what happened is, in, in the early part of the 20th century, there was a movement from the rural areas into mm -hmm. urban areas. And right. the black population... A lot there, of migration happened. A huge migration took place in the early part of the 20th century of black families moving to industrial areas. St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, in order to get work. Um, and because in those communities, it was tended to be, although it was segregated, it's easier if you're living amongst a whole pile of people that you relate to, right. even though you happen to be segregated, as opposed to being the one outlier in an area, which can be very challenging on anybody. Right. So what happened was the blues, which is based on 12 bars, and we will talk about that yeah. to educate everyone here on how 12 bar blues works. It started to permeate in the music and it became its own form and style. As the bluesmen of the time moved north into other areas, of course, they took this music with them, which we are so lucky to have had. When you get up then, the one area I want to talk about is Chicago, because that's where blues really started to make a, a major change. I remember change. that from my days back studying music history theory that Chicago was a big change in the blues. Big time. And, and the reason it started to change was the guys who were moving into there, and f famous names that you'll be familiar with, uh, uh, Lee Hooker, B.B. Um, King. There is a big name in, in blues music. 
These guys were starting to produce this music in Chicago and they started to use electric guitars, which were in their infancy at that time. Must but have they, been. they were getting away from the acoustic side of the house. In addition to that, they would sometimes add accompanying uh, instruments such as bass, often a stand up bass, right, right. piano, even drums. Heaven forbid we bring drums into the house. Because blues is very rhythmically oriented. It's got that da 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 da. It sounds dirty and gripping, and it's so wonderful in what it does. Now, you as a classical musician, and I also as a classical musician, it's important to understand that there are elements within blues that apply to what it is that you and I so, know so much about. Yes. And one of the ideas is that you have these melodic lines that are being written, mm -hmm. which are then superimposed over chordal basis. Right. And by doing the two, and they relate them so that if I'm playing in the key of G, which we can again talk about yeah. later, you will find that the scales that the bluesmen were playing would be in the key of G. They would lock into what was actually right. going on based on this 12 bar blues style. Um, and from that, it solidified into such a way that when you started to hear blues music, it now started to become its own genre. Mm -hmm. So like the Romantic period in yes, classical yes. or the Baroque. Yes. When you hear a Baroque piece of music, you've got a good idea of what you're about to hear. You won't know what notes you're going to play, but... And you know that when you play a certain style, a certain Baroque versus Rococo versus classical versus... Yes romantic, there are certain stylistic interpretive elements which are highly suitable to that particular exactly. period style of music that you really wouldn't want to apply to a different style because it would sound completely weird and out of contact, context and kind of unbalance the whole thing. Totally. So it's going to be the same way with blues if it's becoming its own Style. Genre. Genre. Yes. And, and the thing is, is what we get into in music, as you know, is this idea of principles. Mm -hmm. Yes, I could play a weird set of notes that make no sense to one another, and that is completely viable. But it probably won't be popular because it's not very pleasant to the ear. Whereas blues music, what they were starting to do was... If any of you who saw the drum uh, lesson that I gave to Amy, which you can go here and check out, mm -hmm. um, I was talking about how now the rhythmic side was now locking in with the melodic side. Mm -hmm. So it was a full engagement of everyone in the band. And this will come out later where we start talking between instruments and musicians because we had these principles that we go by. In 12-bar blues, it's the 12-bar blues. Now, it doesn't mean you have to use the 12-bar setup. You can use an 8-bar setup if you wish. But these are principles that these musicians, who were amazing, and were developing this on the fly. It's incredible. And it fits really well, and it works fabulously in that context. It does, and it's very popular mm -hmm. with the listener. And if you listen to blues music, or whatever style of music you like, there's a reason you like that style of music. And it may not be the reason I like it. The same as I will listen to music that you won't necessarily like. But it's because there are these elements at play which give the principles of this music. So in blues, you'll find, for instance, the scales. The scales are a heptonic mm -hmm. bass. And what I mean by heptonic, for those who don't understand, it's based on six notes. Whereas a standard classical musician will look at a seven-note scale, not a six-note. Right. And if you, if you want to get more into that, uh, you can check out the Coffee and Patreon um, membership tiers because I am actually in the process right now of presenting a theory course where we've just gotten into the classical scales and sometime down the road we will touch on the blues scales and some other jazz scales and pentatonic scales and all of those things which is coming up not there yet but the course is in the process and you're welcome to join at any point it's all the videos from from the beginning up until now and continuing as I add to it are going to be there. And it's great you should mention the pentatonic scale. Pentatonic scales are used throughout rock music and throughout uh, blues as well, but in the heptonic situation. So you've got a six note scale that are used in blues, but it's based on the pentatonic scale, which we use all the time in rock music again. And what I want the audience to understand is 
we're starting to make connections here. Okay, yeah. we've got this heptonic, which is based on the pentatonic, which rock musicians use all the time. So we've got a connection. That rhythmic side, again, if you saw my video that I did on drumming, where I demonstrated how we go from da, 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 and we straighten it out. It's a direct relationship. It's the same pattern, but what we're doing is we're straightening it out. With a slightly different stylistic approach. Exactly, and these are the principles that we're talking about. So the idea that everything comes around, it does. It really does. It, it, it does, and when it comes to blues music, there's a direct correlation between the rhythmic side that I'm talking about and also the scale and uh, modal and the melodic side of what's actually going on with the music. So that's what I wanted to tell you about this first song, Cold Shot, mm -hmm. um, where you see these styles all being incorporated. Now, if you were to take Stevie Ray's version of Cold Shot and straighten out that groove, give it a bit more distortion on the guitar, guess what you got? You got a rock song. But he decided to use these principles that we've been discussing, and this is going to come up again and again, these idea of these principles. He was able to come up with a great blues-style piece of music. And yes, one can argue, well, you know, he's not from the Mississippi Delta, therefore he's not a true bluesman. I disagree, because he has the feel and the styles and the principles of that form of music. Right, and in, as, as you're talking about the stylistic principles of different different styles of music, uh, it just came to my mind. Have any of you ever watched any of those videos you sometimes see on YouTube of some musician playing a popular tune in multiple styles? Let's say Happy Birthday, which I know that there's a video out there, more than one, I've seen some, where a pianist sits down and plays it in the style of Bach, in the style of Mozart, in the style of Rachmaninoff, in the style of Liszt, in the style of, of Scott Joplin, in the style of all these different famous names, both classical and moving into the 20th century, and you hear the same tune, the exact same piece of music, being completely transformed depending on which musical stylistic principles and elements are being applied to that. So that's kind of what we're talking about here when you're saying you could straighten this song out and it would become a rock song. Right, exactly. Um, and again, when we speak about principles, when you're talking about a blues song, you tend to look at it from the idea that I've lost something. I may have lost my dog. I may have lost my home. I may have lost my wife. And again, it, this is not meant to be sexist. I'm saying lost my wife because traditionally in the old style, most right, of the blues right. players were male. Right. Um, so that's the kind of things that they will talk about. But that's the stylistic approach. Whereas later on, when we get into other forms of music, in fact, when we talk about big band swing, which we're going to get into very shortly, that's I got the girl. So one is I lost my girl. The other one's I got my girl. Totally different lyrical change. But that is very common to those styles of music. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't have a blues song that's uplifting. And it doesn't mean that you can't have a big band swing song, which is very depressive. But principally, they will often have that kind of right. subject matter in and play. And you hear it in the musical sound as well. One is more down. The yes. other is more happy and upbeat yeah. and almost absolutely determined to be cheery regardless. Yes, and the, the final point I wish to make, when we go through this, for the vast majority of music that you're going to listen to in this historical uh, study that we're doing, is when we get to rock music, but also very heavily on the side of big band swing, to a lesser degree blues, but it's still there, is this idea of dancing. Modern music, and that's not to say again that classical music doesn't do this because some of it does. But modern music is very much inspired to get your body moving and get up and do something. Which right. is why if you go to a symphony orchestra uh, or a symphonic band and s sit and listen to the band, you're probably not going to be getting up in the aisles and doing a jitterbug or a jive. You go to something though that's more big band swing or a rock concert, 
people are going to be up all over the place doing things. And it's because of these principles that we're discussing. So on that note, that's everything I, I had to say mm -hmm. about blues music, a, again, in a very high level, but enough that we can all digest what we're trying to talk right, about right. here. Now, one last thing, Amy, um, I had suggested is what I want to do for all of you is I want to play an electric guitar. Now, the first thing is my primary instrument is not guitar. But I want to play something for you in the 12 bar blues style so that you as the audience who are saying, I don't really get this 12 bar blues. What are they talking about? First off, go to Amy's uh, program that she's showing about uh, theory and how music comes together. And that will clear up some of this. But I wanted to give you a practical example so that you can see it as well, Amy, and go, okay, now I kind of get what they're talking about, this 12 bar blues style. This is not a blues guitar, by the way. <laughs> it's more of a rock guitar. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to actually look at how we're doing this actual performance of how to play this. Again, I stress I'm not a guitarist, but I think I play well enough that you'll get the idea. So what we're going to do is we're going to break down the blues 12 bar uh, structure so that you will understand how it works. Now, the first thing, Amy, I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with my E chord and I'm going to play this pattern. And we're going to play that four times through right, so as four bars. As four bars of that. Mm -hmm. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go to the A. Which, for those of you who don't know, that's, that's your four chord. In other words, if you have one being the first note of your scale, the four is built off of the fourth note of the scale. So we have, we have four bars of one. Yep. And now we have two bars. two bars of four. That's correct. Then we're going to go back to our initial uh, groove note. That's another two, two bars two of bars. one. Two bars, yep, yeah. exactly. And then what we're going to do is we are going to go to for one bar. Right, and that's your five chord. Yep, then we're going to go to the four chord. Four chord again. For one, mm -hmm. and then back to the original one. For two bars. You got it. And yeah. that gives us a total of 12 bars, 12 bars. with four the one, plus four, two, five plus two, chord progression. Plus one, plus one, plus two. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. All right. So I'm going to play the whole thing through now and we'll see how it goes. And then what Amy's going to do is she's going to count out loud, just giving you one, two, as I'm playing through it to let you know where the bars are. So you can see, yes, this actually adds up to 12 bars. So here yeah. we go. I'll count us in and then okay. you start. All right. So a one, two, three, four. One, two. And that's the 12 bar blues, which is going to play heavily into the rock music as we move forward. Anyway, thanks so much for listening to me. Um, but that's how we uh, set something up on the guitar. And again, we'll get more into drums later. The other song that I listened to, the second one, was Sing Sing Sing, which you saw my first listen. And now that we've talked about the blues and how, how that features, I'm curious to see how this big band swing style takes us closer to rock because obviously they're different blues and sing 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 there are similarities but they're different and rock is even more different so let's great hear the story yes yeah, so i pick sing 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 for a reason sing 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 is a very well-known song in the big band uh genre um, big band is very interesting and it's part of the jazz uh, genre. It's a subgenre to jazz and big band swing as the name implies was played with big bands. <laughs> so what is a big band? Well, a big band, there's common structures, structures for a big band and they're considerably larger than those for blues. Uh, for instance, in big band structures, we start adding trombones, saxophones, trumpets. You'll still have your piano, you'll still have your bass, you'll, you'll have drum, definitely have drums in it. it. It will also include other instruments as well. For instance, in Sing Sing Sing, you have a clarinet show up, mm -hmm. which is 
unusual, especially in big band. Okay. Um, but yes, Benny Goodman was famous for playing the clarinet, whereas uh, there were other musicians. Glenn Miller was another famous artist of the time who was a trombone player. So, but they all had this idea in place of a different style of music again. It was based on the jazz style. Remember, again, if you haven't seen my drum video, check it out here, where I talk about this bang a lang or please shut the door pattern. Uh-huh. Yeah, this I remember. Now, this now starts to play predominantly in that style of music. Um, so what you find with the big band players at the time, it was even more danceable and more approachable than blues music and that style of music. It was very, very upbeat. More vibrant and, and positive. So much so. Um, and again, these are principles, so therefore it doesn't always have to be, but generally it was. Um, as I stated in our blues discussion, now you've got the boy gets girl. You know, I think of songs like I Got a Gal in Kalamazoo, which is Michigan for those of you who don't know. Um, very famous song, but very, very positive. I'm out going to see my gal in Kalamazoo. Very positive. So the question then becomes, why do we have this blues style? And now why do we have this big band where especially the lyrical content has changed so much? Why do we have this depressing style of music? Now this upbeat style of music, and that has historical reasons to it. The reason being, if you look at jazz, jazz in its early foundations, which also includes, includes Dixieland and other styles, started to come online in the very early part of the 20th century. As we moved through the 20th century, we went through the Roaring Twenties, mm -hmm. where you had jazz was in its heyday in the Roaring Twenties. But then we came to the Great Depression. And the Great Depression, as the name implies, was very, very difficult on people. Mm -hmm. And the average person who was struggling to get by, and I'm talking about the average now, they turn to other forms of entertainment to bring their spirits up. Um, cinema. If you look at 1930s cinema, Hollywood was booming. And the reason being is because it was an escape. Right, Music right. was the same thing. There was also another thing that started to come to play at this point, and that was the radio. Yes. Previous to this period, yes, some people had radios, but now radios were becoming affordable to the point where everyone could own one. So you had this mass ability to put out music on a very grand scale. Right. So as we go through the Great Depression, this music is trying to bring people's spirits up. It was very danceable, which means you could go out for an evening for five cents or whatever it costs, enjoy yourself and escape the drudgery of what was going on in the world economic order. That makes sense. In addition to this, what was taking place as we were moving through this is a really significant event happened in 1939, which is called the Second World War, mm -hmm. which changed everything. Again, if the Depression was bad enough, if you lived in England, France, uh, uh, Holland, well, the Netherlands, Belgium, life just got really serious for you. And again, Big band swing was a way to bring up that morale see, of people right. because the world was in a pretty crappy place. So classical point. music was getting darker during that time. Yes. But popular music was getting happier, happier. as it were, as happy as you could be <laughs> for the time. So bands like uh, Tommy Dorsey, uh, Glenn Miller, uh, Stan Kenton, um, as we said, Benny Goodman. They were playing music which would take people out of the realm of the depressive and try and bring some optimism, positivity back. Hence, as discussed earlier, the music tended to be upbeat, very happy. And it didn't talk about war. It talked about the positive things that were going on, relationships, how happy life could be. And almost going back to a more positive time of, say, the 1920s in right, concept, right. that there are better times ahead and that this too will end and we will move forward. That was the I essence see. of okay. big band yeah. swing. So you had these bands coming together and they put together this form of music which was related to the blues and that it had this swing groove feel to it, but it was not applied. And your example you used earlier of happy birthday being played in different mm -hmm. styles. These styles are definitely related, but they don't sound the same. No, not at all. Because the principles have changed. Now, 
As far as Sing Sing Sing, the song we heard, I would expect most of you out there and yourself even, as you're listening to it, it's hard not to tap your foot to it. Absolutely. Um, you know, you got... It gets you moving. It does. And the accents and the technical parts of the music. And again, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but the drums, bum, 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 bum. It's not bum, 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 bum. It's not all at the same level. It's got dynamics to right, it. Right. It's got movement. It makes you want to move. That's the beauty of big band swing. So this song in particular, Sing, 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 I have to tell you this story. This is a story that was told to me by some very famous drummers. Um, Joe Morello, some of you out there will know who I'm talking about. He was one of my drum teachers. I would argue he was the finest drummer of the 1960s. And it was Joe Morello that told me this story. Back in 1930s, drummers were kind of in the background. They were using brushes or they were doing little dinky type of playing. They weren't uh, for, They weren't considered really an instrument. Well, even in the blues piece we listened to, and, and you commented earlier, you were saying it was mainly guitar and then some other instruments coming in to accompany and fill, but, but the drum was kind of, Oh my goodness, you're bringing a drum in. Yeah. Okay, fine, but it's certainly not the feature. Certainly, it was almost like the orphan child. Yeah, we got to put up with them. So yeah, let, let the drummer do his or her thing. Let them sit at the back of the band and we'll put up with them for the time being. This all changed with the song Sing, Sing, Sing. Gene Krupa, and if you don't know who Gene Krupa is, look him up. He's very, very important. The reason I play drum set today and the way that I play drum set, I can trace back to Mr. Gene Krupa. Wow. Now, Gene Krupa was an amazing drummer, um, and he was also a movie star as well, and people don't realize this. In 1940, he was apparently in 140 movies oh in goodness. Hollywood, as well as playing drum set. And there's a great mu movie that I had recommended uh, Amy and Vlad to watch called The uh, Gene Krupa Story. Yes, it's a little hokey by today's standards, but it gives you an idea of the feel and what Gene was all about even though it's not that positive about him as a human being. But he was a very nice guy, and I met Gene, and he was a very charming man. Um, anyway, the story goes as such. Benny Goodman had his band. Gene Krupa was his drummer at the time. And Gene Krupa went to him with an idea. He said, do you want to be the top band on the planet? And of course, well, what band leader would say no? So he said, yeah, what's your idea, Gene? And he said, okay, I've got this song which is the Louis Prima song, Sing, Sing, Sing. He said, but I want to change it and I want to make it drum heavy and drum centric. And uh, Benny Goodman was not totally comfortable with this idea. He said, well, carry on. Well, what do you want to do? He said, I want to bring the drum set to the front of the band, which was sacrilege. He said, and I want to play this song with a heavy drum beat to it. And then the rest of the band is kind of accompanying me as I go through the song. Well, Benny Goodman's head would explode at that point. What are you I talking about? So Gene said, here's the deal. If you let me play it and the audience doesn't dance for more than 15 minutes, I'll work for you for free. And at that time, Gene was a very well-paid drummer. He said... But if the audience stays up for 15 minutes or longer, then what you'll do is double my salary. And which okay. would, at that point, make Gene Krupa the highest paid musician on the planet. Wow. So they decided that, yeah, okay, we're going to do this. It happened in New York City back in 1936. And they got up and they started to play the song. 45 minutes into it, the the audience was going crazy as Gene was doing that famous dun 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 And they just couldn't believe it. And it rocketed uh, uh, Benny Goodman and his band to the top of stardom. Now, why is this significant to us? It's a nice story, whether it's true or not. Well, I can see the significance already because obviously in rock music, the drums are a major feature. I mean, all this music I've been listening to is very drum heavy. Yeah. And so if that was the first step in that direction, it's, it's massive. It was. And it started to influence all the other music that came around it. Because, okay, if Benny Goodman got to the top and we got this guy, Gene Krupa, what can we do? And you had guys like Papa Joe Jones and Buddy Rich and all of these superb drummers all coming forward saying, 
hey, you think he's good? Watch what I do. And so what it did is it brought this mass appeal to the music. Again, remember everybody, we're talking about dance music. Right. You don't dance to what the singer is doing. You right. don't necessarily dance to what the piano player is doing, but you do dance to what the drummer is doing. So by Gene pulling this forward and making it a primary instrument, which was valid, allowed us to move forward into a form of music, which we call rock music, which would be focused on high energy. It would be focused on danceability. It would be more rhythm oriented than the music that we had heard before. Again, there are exceptions, but this was the general focus and general direction we were going. Yeah, in. it's it's the case even in classical music. I mean, you think of classical style dances, the waltz. Yeah. It's all about the rhythm and there's a certain rhythmic feel a certain rhythmic feature where if you play a waltz well it's going to make people want to move well there probably aren't drums in there but it's all about the rhythm it is and someone who can play a shaker expertly just take a shaker and play it mm -hmm. if they do that with mastery and competence you can't help but feel the groove that's going on right. now one last thing uh, i wanted to comment about this is that when it comes to big band swing, because it is a form of jazz, jazz and blues differ in fundamental ways, but one of the ways that it does differ is jazz tends to be more complex. It doesn't necessarily follow right. the 12-bar blues groove. And I'm not good enough a guitarist to show you how a jazz player would do it. Graham could. I just can't because yeah, yeah. I don't have those <laughs> That's skills. That's okay. That's okay. But... What we're doing is we're now bringing in a complexity to the music that wasn't there before. Because as you and I have discussed offline together, one has to remember that the music of the masses does not necessarily have to be complex. Country music is very popular for that. Very simple grooves, very simple elements exactly. to it. But it's exactly. popular because the average person goes, yeah, hey, I like that. It sounds great. Whereas you get into progressive metal music and things like this and it's like what on earth are you guys doing none of this makes any sense but it's something you develop which i hope to develop in you so by the time you get into hardcore progressive metal and things like this you'll be going okay i don't necessarily like it but i get what they're trying to accomplish right, right, right. and i know that you've already experienced some of that in some of your other videos that you've done where it's Okay, I'm not really crazy on it, but I get what they're trying to do and I respect them for yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so that that's what I had to talk about today with uh, Big Band right. Swing. That makes sense and um, that's really fascinating to me as a musician because I, I can totally relate to styles influencing and changing and developing new styles. And it's the story of music for centuries for millennia really because that's just the way music goes it is and again back over to all of you please give us your comments um i'm very interested if you have other bands that maybe you think i haven't heard of or that you want to expose me to or even modern day big band you know i, I brian sets or orchestra comes to mind which okay. i have a song for you to listen to of his later listened, on i haven't listened um, to that. but it's more in the rockabilly style but we'll get more into that later but please provide those kind of comments and challenge me on some of the things i may have said if you've heard different stories we're open to all information because Absolutely. it makes all of us better educated at the end of the yeah. day Anyways, All right. thanks. Thank you. Yeah.